the main reason we have New York City as such a powerful city in the US and across the world is because of shipping. However, shipping has gone through many iterations throughout this city's history. Today, we're going to learn about a very cool project, the Schooner Apollonia, which is bringing shipping, old style shipping, back to the river along the Hudson and the New York Harbor. I'm Ariel, and I'm with Classic Harbor Line, where we're exploring all the harbor here in New York City, both rivers, the Hudson and the East River and beyond. Let me know where you're watching from. Today, we're going to meet the team behind the Schooner Apollonia and other special guests that represent all wonderful projects along the New York Harbor. Let me know where you're watching from and slam that like button right now because there's a lot of people that want to watch videos like this and join us on the harbor. Some people can't physically come here uh, for various reasons, so it's nice to bring this to the world. That's why we're doing these live streams. So let me know if you're on Team Like and let me show you one more time the views. Right now we have departed from Pier 62 on Classic Harbor Line, classicharborline.com. Check them out, they have tours all year round uh, and a variety of different tours. And give me a second as I show you the views. There we go. All right. I was just letting you take in the views before we speak to our wonderful cast and crew. So right now we have Brad Vogel of the Schooner Apollonia. How's it going, Ariel? <laughs> oh, what is the Schooner Apollonia, first and foremost? Yeah, well, a schooner is a type of sail. Yeah, yeah, I'll head over here. A schooner is a type of sailing ship. And so the Schooner Apollonia is actually a steel hulled vessel it was built in 1946, and so a lot of people think, oh, sailing, the past. Well, let me tell you, we are proof that it is also the present and the future. Uh, we're all about sailing goods, shipping goods sustainably with as little carbon, a little, as, as few emissions as possible to move goods, mostly from the Hudson Valley region of New York down to New York City here and around New York Harbor. Um, it's really cool because we, we use almost no fossil fuels to move hundreds of thousands of pounds of goods. Wow, that's very impressive. Yeah. And how is that possible? What's, what's the history of the ship? So the ship moves using the power of the wind chiefly. It's literally a sailboat and it moves using the wind. But on Hudson River, it's actually kind of interesting because the Hudson is really an arm of the sea. It's actually closer to what we think of as a fjord. Um, you might hear, hear about that in Norway. Yeah. Um, this is an arm of the sea that the glacier carved out and it's also the Hudson River. <laughs> but what happens is not only do you get to use the wind, when there's no wind, you can also use the tide. The tide goes in, the tide goes out, and it shifts just about every six hours. And so even if Schooner Apollonia is heading south down the river for New York City with a hold full of malted barley and maple syrup, and all kinds of things for people down here. Coffee as well. <laughs> <laughs> Coffee too. Uh, absolutely. But as it's heading down here, if there's no wind, sometimes we say it's faster at anchor. So oh, literally we'll just drop the anchor and then wait for the tide to come back around and then you can slowly make your way in the right direction using the tide. So it's a really special thing way for sail freight. And how old is the ship? The ship itself is from 1946, mm. so it's from just after World War II, but it was purchased in about 2015 or so, and a group of people led by Captain Sam Merritt up in Hudson, New York, spent all kinds of time on the side, getting the boat ready, refitting it, putting in masts, putting in the rigging, and by 2020, it was ready to go, and we started hauling cargo. And we got one voyage to New York City in, despite the pandemic in 2020. 
since then, yeah, we've done full full uh, seasons of voyages in 2021 and 2022. So we're bringing people in New York City, all kinds of stuff, from hot sauce to solar panels to pumpkins. So you have a, like a goodie bag. To we, do, we do, we oh, <laughs> do. All right, let's take a seat over yeah. here. Yeah. So what we have here is... And let me close these photos. Those were the yeah. photos of the Apollonia that people were seeing. So this is called a boat box. Mm -hmm. Now, people might be familiar with a CSA, where you, like, they get produce from farms brought to them in the city. The boat box is sort of like that, except it comes via a schooner. It comes by a ship, and it's shelf-stable stuff, because we don't have refrigeration on board, so yeah. it has to be stuff that can make it without that. And but, let me pause you there, because yeah. uh, people are asking, uh, to clarify, right now we are not on the <laughs> Polonia, but we are indeed on the splash zone. <laughs> yes, indeed. This is the Kingston from Classic Harbor Line, but the Apollonia has a very close relationship with Classic Harbor Line. And uh, the photos and videos I'm showing you are of uh, the Apollonia. Yes, okay. and I'm, I'm so glad also that we just had that nice little wave visit us to prove to people online that this is real, this is live. <laughs> it is, and indeed salty. Yes. It is salt water. <laughs> So, yeah. as you were saying... With oh, the, yeah, so the boat box. So, I'll just pull a few items out oh, of this so little goodie bag here, just so people can see what we've got going on. Now, this is actually something called Flotsam Beer, mm -hmm. very aptly named. And this is a beer where Schooner hauls the malted barley mm -hmm. to Beacon, New York, to High Valley Brewery, and then it's made into beer, and then the schooner later picks up the beer in these cans and brings it down to New York City, and it gets served on Classic Harbor Lines vessels cruising around in the harbor. So it's a super fun story because we've cool. we've woven sustainability into multiple legs of the product's journey. So, so. I to feel guilty when drinking that beer. Absolutely. You're going to feel great. <laughs> great. That's awesome. And then um, uh, Freddie says on the comments, don't you mean the North River? Oh, yeah. Okay. There we go. Somebody <laughs> knows their history. Yes. Yeah, so another name for the Hudson River is the North River, and that's right. the way that a lot of mariners will still refer to it today and some of the charts. Exactly. Uh, but that goes all the way back to the Dutch times in, in New York. Mm. And then today, can you give us a rundown of what is the course that we're going to take around? Sure. Yeah, no, I'm super excited. I mean, what an incredible day to be out here. But we are heading southbound right now on the Hudson River or the North River. Yeah. We have Manhattan off to our left. We have New Jersey off to our right. And we are going to be proceed down into New York Harbor, also called the Upper Bay. And then we're going to round the battery and head past Governor's Island down the Buttermilk Channel. Uh, so many things to learn about as we go. Oh, very cool. And then we're going to round Red Hook and actually go up into the mouth of the notorious Gowanus Canal. The one of the super fun sites. Absolutely. One of the most polluted bodies of water in America. Um, and we'll have more to say about that. Okay. I do, in fact, happen to live in Gowanus, so I know a thing or two there. Oh, nice. um, and from there, we'll head back out of, into Gowanus Bay and then around Governor's Island and back up the river here to Chelsea Piers. Very cool. Thank you so much for giving us that rundown. Sure. And what else is... Oh yeah, let's yeah. see what other goodies we have here. Now, I mentioned malt earlier, so I just want to get a handful. When we say malt, mm. this is malted barley, and this is what goes into beer. So when we haul malted barley, we're hauling it to mm. mostly breweries, but sometimes also to distilleries. And speaking of distilleries, we actually age a barrel of rye whiskey aboard each oh, season. Really? And this is made by Spirits Lab up in Newburgh, New York. And then once the barrel gets offloaded, it gets bottled. Yeah. And we take it down here to the city. So it's a really fun product. And you can see on here we have our little tag that certifies that it is wind shipped. <laughs> brought places by a vessel using wind. Now I have to say, just for yeah. full disclosure, that the Schooner Apollonia does have an engine on board. It has an old 1950s diesel engine. but how often do we actually use that engine? We use it less than 2% of the time that the vessel's underway. So we zealously avoid using it unless we absolutely have to. That's For if we have to get off to, yeah, emergencies, safety situations, or getting on and off of a tricky dock. Okay. Um, but our crew is really great and we can often sail off of a dock, um, which takes some experience and takes some work, um, but we have a really great crew and we have several certified captains in our crew, in addition to Captain Sam Merritt, who leads the whole venture. Um, but we also really do something special, which is we keep some of these skill sets alive. So yeah. people literally keep learning how to sail because they're on our vessel. And we have people like Tanya Van Rennes, who 
got her what's called her captain's ticket. She became a captain based on the time she spent working on Schooner Apollonia. So we love the fact that like people talk about green jobs. We are building green jobs with Schooner Apollonia for real. Oh yeah, and in terms of for context, the Hudson is a bit tricky to sail through. Yes, right? yes, the Hudson is not necessarily an easy river to sail on. Sometimes the winds are quite strange. Sometimes it gets really narrow. Um, so it really takes some great skills and a lot of like time spent on the water to understand the waterway. But that's actually part of the fun is that Schooner Apollonia gets people to look again at our waterway because our engagement with the waterfront has like atrophied so hard in for like decades for the last 50 60 years so it makes it extra impressive yes actually, yeah. and when we show up at a town it's really exciting and it gets people thinking that's what i love too is that when we show up um say in Terrytown, new york Ooh. and we pick up first of all what we do is we bring green coffee beans from carteret new jersey to Terrytown to coffee labs roasters and then they make coffee from it roast it and then we pick up the bags and the bags of coffee, which is called Apollonia Blend, oh, fascinating. goes in our boat box. And then the people who subscribe to get boat boxes have this nice shoe box because we try to keep it as oh, sustainable really cool. as possible. It's available to uh, people. Yeah, to so people to. can subscribe to that. I yeah. do love this coffee. I, I give it a personal recommendation. Uh -huh. I can't wait to try the whiskey and the beer. <laughs> well, Coffee Labs is a really good roaster. Amazing. All right, let's go on to our next guest. Then we'll tell okay. you later at the end. Sounds great. Uh, for anyone who might have questions for Brad for sailing across the Hudson and shipping the old style. All right. All right. So who do we have up next? Okay, our next guest here is someone who's been amazing and such a friend of the boat and of Sail Freight, <laughs> Nika Carlson. And Nika, Nika is a yeah. cider maker, so I'll let her tell you more. Oh, very cool. Great. Okay, so tell Hi me there. all about cider. Grab a seat. Welcome to my office. Oh, thank you. It's a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful space you have here. So, so uh, tell me everything about making cider here along the Hudson. How does that work? So, um, I'm based up uh, in Hudson, New York itself. Okay. Um, so, right along along the river, um, where I have a small orchard, I have a small cidery, um, and I make cider in really traditional methods, really kind of low intervention in the style of natural wine, um, and low impact on the earth as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually share property with um, Captain Sam Merritt mm -hmm. of Schooner Apollonia. Um, so we are very close partners um, where I get to work with them all the time and kind of see what the boat is up to. Oh, that's wonderful. And then uh, you work with the Schooner Apollonia. So how, mm -hmm. how does shipping work when it comes to from getting it to cans or bottles onto the boat? Um, so everything I make is in bottles, um, but uh, it's very easy when Sam goes down to the boat um, on his uh, electric powered bike. Um, we are just packing uh, boxes onto the back of the bike. Um, but I do a CSA through Apollonia. So people sign up to receive um, a box each time the boat does a run up and down the river. Um, CSA members at various ports just pick up directly from the boat itself. Um, I also do a little bit of wholesale mm. via the boat, so um, vendors who are ordering directly from me to have cider shipped to them sustainably via wind power on Apollonia. Um, I've also done some other really cool projects with Apollonia. One of the first great connections that I had, that Apollonia had um, with Classic Harbor Lines um, was doing a, a like a, a very kind of traditional old school method of delivery, where Classic Harbor Lines ordered some cider from me. It was brought down to the boat on bike. It was moved from Hudson down here to Manhattan via wind power, and then actually um, we had some rowboats meet us actually not far from here, uh, down along at like Pier 40, oh, nice. um, where we unloaded cider into the rowboats, and then the rowboats along with the cider and myself went to Classic Harbor Line. So it was a really nice series of connections with a lot of different community partners that um, I think really set up some great relationships for us. That's great. Where can people find the cider nowadays, uh, physically? Physically? Yeah. Um, they can find it at a lot of places. They can find it on my website, mm. um, where they can order for it to be delivered by myself. Um, people can still sign up for CSA shares for the fall when we do our second set of runs in September and October. Um, 
They can also find it here in Manhattan at Fulton Stall Market, which is another great Apollonia partner where cider actually shares get picked up um, for CSA members. Sometimes I sell there at the market. Um, and then at various natural wine stores around the city in the Hudson Valley. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, and people, uh, I don't think people really realize, but uh, New York was, I'm not sure it still is, the mm -hmm. capital of apples and cider. Yeah, yeah, I mean, New York has always been a really great apple state. Um, some of the, the best. the myth, uh, Johnny Appleseed. I mean, Johnny Appleseed was a real person. Oh, there we go. And okay, Johnny go. Appleseed sure. actually, um, he was planting apples for cider. I mean, cider really was New York's or original best beverage mm. when people were original beverage I should say for for colonizers <laughs> right. um, but as as um, Europeans were coming and colonizing America and exploring they were um, bringing apples with them most apples actually are native to the US mm. um, and so apples were brought over from Europe they were planted and they were planted in order to make cider just because a lot of um, sources of water were not particularly safe so um, everyone adults kids were drinking cider throughout the day as the way to keep refreshed that's amazing one more time what's the name of the cider um uh, my cidery is called greenpoint cidery greenpoint cidery greenpoint Green Point cidery everyone try it out oh i'm excited to try it out myself uh that's amazing thank you again so much i appreciate you're it. welcome and uh you can uh tell pat to pat. yeah all right thank you so much so right over here, everyone, that was wonderful to learn about Greenpoint Cidery. Right now, we are seeing the views of downtown Manhattan with uh, One World Trade Center there in the distance. We're going to go around the New York Harbor and we're going to hug Brooklyn, go all the way to Gowanus, which I'm super hyped for. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Jonathan, that was a great question about sugar. I'll ask Pat, uh, which will be very interesting to talk to about. down there how long has the Apollonia been doing this uh, DS okay two great questions we'll ask Pat real quickly uh, I'll introduce you to Pat so Pat actually be or oh, Brad oh, sorry uh, <laughs> before to before we continue on to our next guest we have two questions sure do you guys ship sugar and then B, uh, how long have you been shipping? We don't ship sugar, but if someone has some and they want it shipped and they're willing to pay a little price, we will do so. Okay, <laughs> Let me <perfect>. know. <laughs> and then how long have you been shipping? So we have been shipping since 2020. Our first cargo that actually went down the Hudson to New York City was yeah. August of 2020. Okay, yep. perfect. And then who, who do we have up next? We have a very special guest, one of the foremost experts on the history of sail freight in America, Steve Woods. Steve is someone who uh, was associated with the Hudson River Maritime Museum in Kingston, um, but has a wealth of knowledge. And we're, we're coming up on the Battery, which is the southernmost tip of New York City, of Manhattan Island. And this is a place where people would often go to promenade in the park and watch all the vessels out in the harbor. And so what better place than here for Steve to tell us a little bit about the history of sustainable shipping. All right. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, yeah, what, what is the history of sustainable shipping here? And then feel free to sit down. Thank you. I'm a little rusty on my sea legs. Yeah. Uh, so, well, to give a really short version, um, most shipping was sustainable until around the 1870s. That's when you see the rise of steam shipping, which of course is all powered by coal. And then define sustainability uh, uh, for shipping specifically. For shipping, for this in particular, we're really using zero carbon. It okay. was done under sail. Okay. Um, now that is not the exactly the same as sustainable. Uh, for example, Greece is a semi-arid climate. Mm -hmm. It is that way, in fact, because all the trees were cut down to build ships during the Homeric age. And oh, it's really? still oh, in effect absolutely. today. Yeah. Yes. So sustainable and zero carbon are not exactly the same. <laughs> right. uh, that needs to be kept in mind. But uh, when you're talking zero carbon, what we would consider to be a sustainable uh, shipping, zero carbon emissions, the real target right now, then yes, it all was, again, until the 1870s. That, that changes my entire perception of Greece now. That's fascinating. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, I, I've read that 
<laughs> last year and was completely <laughs> baffled, but yes. And then uh, as we're passing here mm -hmm. in the battery, can you paint a picture of what it used to lo look like back in the time of sales? Well, um, everything along here, every every little inlet we've seen so far uh, out the uh, uh, port side here uh, on New York was full of ships. It literally looks like a forest with all the mass yard arms, everything else. Right. Uh, so it is packed. The battery also held the customs house, if I remember correctly. Yeah, a little bit So down. basically, you end up anchoring uh, off here uh, or up and then checking in with customs. So this is going to be the main point where everybody coming in from the Veranzano uh, and uh, entering this harbor is going to go to. Mm. That's mostly transatlantic stuff, though, or, uh, or overseas. The main thing you're going to see here in New York, uh, aside from that, is coastal trade. And that's going to be in things like schooners, sloops coming down the Hudson, uh, things of that nature. Because New York is a massive port of aggregation. Right. So all the cargo, all the agricultural cargo, uh, for example, during the 18th century, New York, the Hudson Valley in particular, is the breadbasket of Southern Europe and all of the West Indies. Uh, and so all of the agricultural cargoes coming down the Hudson, coming in from Long Island, they all come to this harbor. And then it gets transshipped onto larger vessels that are going to go to those farther locations. Mm -hmm. And uh, even goods coming in uh, from, uh, you know, the Carolinas, Florida, uh, those other coastal locations that trade in here are coming in even under sail into the 1920s. Uh, All the way until 1920s? Yes. Wow. Uh, in fact, it does extend to a degree into the 1930s, but it's very difficult to document how much. Right. Uh, there's a huge slump in the 1920s of mm -hmm. volumes of shipping. Uh, because during the First World War, they finally put the effort into finishing the U.S. rail system. So now there's competition with, or more competition with railways. For example, there would be gantries as we would be passing oh, yeah. by that would connect the rail infrastructure of Manhattan with uh, New Jersey yep. over here. Yep, exactly. Uh, and there were a lot of uh, rail ferries that were uh, run by tugs and barges and such things that went back and forth mm. uh, as opposed to rail bridges. So that was the main replacement for sale? For sale in coastal trade, mostly yes, it was the railway. Mm. And then... The main, the main reason why it stops, essentially, gets kind of a boost in the 20s. Uh, it was declining. The First World War happens. Anything that can steam faster than 16 knots is pressed into transatlantic service. Right. Because they can outrun a U-boat. Oh, interesting. Sailing vessels take massive losses from U-boats during the war. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, because they cannot sail faster World than U-boat. World War One, yes. Uh, and so that basically stops the transatlantic trade under sail. But because so many ships are destroyed, you get two things. The sailing vessels were put on the coastal trade, reassigned to that by the uh, uh, national nationalized control of shipping, because there weren't any U-boats over here. Or, well, there were two, but that's all that made it here. So they were relatively safe. They didn't have to sail extremely fast to avoid them. And they relieved the cargo for the, transit, for the fast steamers to go across the Atlantic. And then... A lot of ships are destroyed. We're still rebuilding. We get the Jones Act of 1920, which says any uh, vessel going between two U.S. ports carrying cargo or passengers has to be U.S. built, U.S. flagged, U.S. owned, and crewed by U.S. sailors. Oh, interesting. Okay. It's still in effect today. Yeah, yeah. And I know so, it intimately because I'm yes. originally from Puerto Rico. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep, it, yeah. It, then it, you it know it very, Rico. very well. It's a terrible problem for yeah. you. Yeah. And well, so the Jones Act was to encourage rebuilding the okay. U.S. fleet. But of course, a lot of the ships that are in this tr coastal trade, while those ships are being rebuilt uh, be in the early 20s, are still sailing because that's the ships that are available and that survived. Uh, and then over the course of the 20s, you have a sh slump in international shipping. The war volume of shipping has declined. And so you get a, a big change there because the steamers take over. They're much, much larger. They can keep a schedule. They have other economic advantages as opposed to sustainability advantages uh, that were considered more important at the time. Exactly. Of course, they also established the problems that we currently have, so that's a, that's a, that's a different issue. And led to overcrowding of the waterways for quite a while, right? Yes, yes. yes. And then um, DS asks, um, what is the future of sailing? Because luckily we don't have U-boats, uh, um, hopefully not hunting down. Uh, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> not that I am aware yeah. of, at least. You'd think that hit the news. Uh, what's the f future of sailing? Well, coastally, yeah. it actually makes the most sense to do it coastally to start. Mm -hmm. Historically, the coastal trade is the training ground for sailors. 
you learn on these schooners, on these smaller vessels, and then you get a berth on these transatlantic vessels. And there's an additional sustainability advantage. I wrote my master's thesis on what it would take to bring back sailing cargo vessels as an adaptation to climate change. Right. And if you look at transatlantic shipping on like the container ships we can now see over here on the far side of uh, Governor's Island, uh, those are one of the most efficient forms of transport available in the world right, right now. Uh, until you put sails on it, then it's even better. But trucks and trains are not. So if you use your sailing vessel to replace trucks and trains, you get a larger carbon advantage than if you're replacing those very, very large ships. Oh, cool. So work that the Apollonia is doing is actually even better than, carbon-wise at least, mm. uh, the transatlantic sailing that you're seeing uh, revive. But all these routes are open. And so by encouraging coastal sailing and coastal trade, we can get more skilled hands that we'll need as we expand uh, sail into transoceanic sailing. So there's a huge future for both. And uh, especially here in the Northeast, there's plenty of water for both. Oh, that's amazing. Wow, and uh, Almo says you really know your history down. Uh, I worked in museums for 20 years. It great. goes with the territory. Okay. Where can people find more about the history and then also your own work? So uh, my own work is mostly on ResearchGate, uh, so you can, you can find it, uh, Steve Woods. Uh, um, the Center for Post-Carbon Logistics, under publications, has the Sail Freighter Handbook, mm. or the Sail Freight Handbook. It's a free PDF, uh, so download that. It is an introduction, it's the how-to manual, and it has a huge amount of uh, references for, resource, uh, for research following every segment. So find what you're interested in the Sail Freight Handbook and go from there. That's great. Oh, I could talk to Steve for a few hours at least because that's very fascinating. Uh, let's move on to our next guest, though. Thank All you so right. much, Steve. No I problem. appreciate Thank it. You. All right. Okay, and I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> Here as we are coming into the East River behind me, Beautiful. which is not really a river, it's a tidal strait. Ooh, okay. <laughs> and then uh, do you sail ever up there? Yes, yeah, Schooner do. Apollonia does sail, and I mean cool. sail with its, with its sails up, using wind power, all the way up to uh, Long Island City, Queens. We are have there definitely docked there. Are there any height concerns? Uh, the real concern, no, no, no concerns about height with the bridges. The real concern is just sort of irregularity of the wind. Okay. Because you have all these big buildings in Manhattan, you mm. get these strange wind canyons and strange sort of like wind variations. But, uh, but yeah, we sail the East River. So, but I'm going to tell you now about. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Susan yeah. says, have them sail you to Puerto Rico. Have you sailed down <laughs> to the Caribbean? We have Maybe not. No. no. Okay, but okay. if we can work, actually, I'm just about to introduce someone okay. who works with a vessel that does sail stuff to the Caribbean. Oh, so again, if you want to sail something to the Caribbean, uh, you should talk with with our next guest. That's amazing. Oh, hey. I'm so Ariel. this is. Hey, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. This is Pierre. Pierre. Um, oh, and yeah, just a word about Pierre. Pierre works with an incredible company that he can tell you more about called Grande Sail. And Grande Sail sails stuff across the Atlantic Ocean to right here in New York Harbor. Okay, perfect. Pierre, Thanks, feel free to sit down. Thanks. Um, also, to let us know about how is it shipping outside of How is it going outside of the harbor? Uh, by sail. By All sail, the time, yeah, yeah. yeah. And is that a difficult endeavor? Uh, I mean, the, um, we operate a modern cargo sailboat, okay. so it's uh, it's purposefully built to uh, to transport merchandise across the Atlantic. And uh, unless we we do the mandatory harbor operations uh, with a motor, uh, all the rest is done by sail, 100%. Mm. Uh, so of course, it's uh, four professional sailors that operate the the sailboat. So uh, I. I don't think that, in their opinion, it's a it's a hard task for them to do. Oh, uh, it's just a matter of uh, taking the right wind and cross the like go under the Verrazzano Bridge, and then uh, you're out at sea and co you yep. can sail. What's the name of the vessel? So, um, uh, in the company, everything is kind of branded Grande Sail, which okay. is the the name of the company, the name of the chocolates, and the name of the sailboat as well. So it's Grande Sail. Oh, wonderful! wonderful. Yeah. And then, uh, what's the relationship with uh, Schooner Apollonia? So basically, um, both these two companies operate uh, schooner sailboats to basically uh, provide a carbon-free alternative to transporting merchandise. Mm. Um, what they do is they sail up and down the Hudson, and what we do is we sail across the Atlantic. Uh, oh, wow. So we do transatlantic loops from France to the US, then to the US down to the Caribbean, and to the Caribbean back to France. And, and what's the port in France? Uh, uh, it's Saint-Malo. Okay. 
So from uh, from like each leg of this voyage has a specific purpose in terms of what merchandise we transport. Yeah. Uh, from Saint Malo, France, over to New York City, we transport mainly wine spirits, chocolates, and uh, luxury and fashion products. Oh, that's really cool. Uh, for other companies and for ourselves. Uh, we then unload everything in New York. Uh, can you give us a, sorry to uh, pause you there, but uh, can you give us an example of the wine and chocolate? Yeah, cover? totally. So the wines, basically, uh, we, we internalize the sourcing. So yeah. we're really trying to go the extra mile in terms of like uh, the philosophy of what we transport on these sailboats. So we sign in uh, in Champagne, in Bordeaux, in the Loire Valley, and we really focused on these winemakers who were first time exporters and would not be exporting if it wasn't done sustainably. Mm. So we provide this missing uh, brick to a sustainable grant export uh, for these winemakers who are like already like pretty well known in, uh, in France and like are willing to, to export their products all the way to the United States but they want to find a way that is as sustainable as the way they work in the, in the vineyard and in the cellar. What's one uh, wine that, that you guys uh, ship? What's one wine that you guys ship? Uh, so the the funny anecdote is that we also ship uh, one of a, a wine that's branded under Grand Sale from Burgundy. Oh, good. Because we <laughs> nice. the the ambition was really to represent one winemaker from uh, every wine producing regions. Yeah. But the 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 problem in Burgundy is that this region produces wine that are so highly demanded over here that we couldn't find. Uh, um, a winemaker that wasn't exported already uh, mm -hmm. conventionally to the US. So instead of giving up on uh, featuring uh, wine from Burgundy, uh, we made our own. So we transport some, uh, some uh, red and white Burgundy uh, under white label. It was a collaboration. We also participated to the winemaking process. And uh, it's distributed here in uh, New York and Manhattan uh, oh, under the Grand Sale brand name. Yeah. find it? So people can find it um, on, in different wine stores uh, and restaurants. So it's like both on premise and off premise uh, in Manhattan and uh, and uh, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, and uh, the easiest really is to go on the website and uh, and look for all the locations that we have. We 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 are present in about 45 um, wine stores, bars, and restaurants. And it's uh, mainly these places with a focus on natural. Biodynamic wines and uh, and a strong um, strong outlook on sustainability. Okay, I'm getting a lot of questions about the chocolate, and then the second question is, uh, Freddie asks, does it have an aluminum hole? Yes. So for the second question, the the I, I, I say it because uh, as opposed to Apollonia, which uses uh, it's uh, the retrofitting of a of an older schooner. Okay. We started the construction of our first uh, commercial sailboat in 2018. So it's fully aluminum made uh, and the idea is to use a material that is light, that is 100% uh, recyclable and that's also a, a very good way to isolate the hold and uh, to, to transport uh, fragile merchandise such as uh, chocolate. Oh nice. And then how about chocolate? What, what, what's the chocolate? Where can people find the chocolate? So the chocolate is uh, basically kind of the, the inception of the company. The, yeah. the, 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 the motive of the two founders was really to, to, to bring ingredients and merchandise that come from far away in a more sustainable way. Right. Uh, and uh, this exotic uh, Are you raw. The finish, uh, sorry to interrupt, the finished product or the actual raw? So, cash? both. Okay. Cool. So, we are shipping the finished products from France to the US for distribution, but we're also selling. Uh, the raw ingredients, mainly uh, the cocoa and coffee beans right. from the Caribbean back to France to go supply our factory. Mm. Uh, so the chocolates, they're basically uh, like what uh, self-financed the construction of the first sailboat. So the, the idea of the two founders was to start making chocolate. So they partner with one of the best chocolate makers in France uh, to, to really come up with this, uh, these good recipes. Mm. Uh, we internalized the sourcing of the, the ingredients and came up with these recipes with the promise of eventually uh, building this uh, commercial sailboat with the proceeds of the sales of these chocolates. Uh, it did work out because, uh, as I said, we really focus on taste and quality to, uh, to, to not only have people support the, the project by buying one bar, but really create this, uh, this repeat purchase. So, so after mastering the, 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 the chocolate sale and distribution, we were able to, uh, to build this first sailboat. And since, uh, since basically January of this year, we, are, we, we launched uh, the distribution of these chocolates in the city um, through uh, right now. Right now, 
uh, and we're about to launch uh, e-commerce uh, in uh, in summer of 2023. Oh, great! Uh, but only for New York City and uh, and working uh, working to expand uh, like still in a, in, a, in a close loop to to where the, the finished product is being unloaded, mm. uh, but to make it available for uh, for people here in New York City and uh, really enjoy the taste of a good uh, made in France chocolate. And it's uh, wind ship not coming from one of those containers. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> where can people find more about your work and? Uh, your product so we have uh, we have a presence on uh, social media so we're on Instagram you can follow Grandesale underscore USA or Grandesale wines for like more specific like uh, wine um, uh, description and uh, what we do like all the events that we throw uh, we have a website that uh, is uh, already uh, uh, working like for our US operations uh, it's um, it's Grandesale um, um, iPhone uh, overseas uh, and there we basically list all the locations, all the products and uh, all that we're up to uh, in terms of like uh, transatlantic loops. Um, and yeah, and if there's one thing you must know, uh, we, we are growing and changing scale uh, big time in 2024 uh, with the, the, the construction of a second cargo sailboat that's going to be twice as big, twice as wide and twice as large. So we're going to transition from uh, two loops per year uh, carrying about 25 tons of merchandise. Right to uh, five loops a year uh, with 350 tons uh, of merchandise uh, every year. Um, and, and here what we're doing is we're, we're kind of developing a new vertical of, a, of a pure um, transportation services for other companies that wish to go carbon free uh, for their, their international exploitations cool. on the routes that we currently uh, exploit. Uh, and we are getting a, a lot of traction since we developed this uh, this new service. So, in, and on top of distributing our own products, we're now also a, um, a commissioner Wonderful. for uh, other companies from France to the U.S., but also from the U.S. back to France, mm. and as well uh, going down to the Caribbeans. Wonderful, Pierre. Thank you so much. I appreciate Thank it. you so much, man. Hello, hello. So where are we passing through now? So we are cruising down the Buttermilk Channel. We just went past the Atlantic Basin over there. And now we're coming into Red Hook, Brooklyn. Okay. And that's very fitting because the next guest here is actually a crew member of the schooner Apollonia. And she lives in Red Hook. So we have Alexis. Yeah. Take it away. All right. Thank you. Feel free to sit down. Welcome to my office. Thank you. Nice office. Yeah. <laughs> it's very on the current to move us um, you know we're, we're a big steel hull schooner right that's loaded down with cargo and so if there's not a lot of wind um, and you've got current pushing against you you're not gonna go anywhere right and so oftentimes if the current is against us we'll just have to drop anchor and wait it out you know and then so your sleep patterns get a little crazy um, you know you're rotating on and off um, and yeah, we make stop. We start in Hudson, and then it takes us usually about a week to get down to the city. Um, really, a week to complete all the shipping routes. Mm -hmm. Mostly because we're making stops. Right. You know, if um, I think you could do the the trip straight through maybe in just a couple of days, wind depending. But for people who've never been up to Hudson, can yeah. you describe like what are the stops and um, the so sites you, you see along yeah, the way? Yeah, yeah. Usually, uh, when we leave Hudson, the first stop is Saugerties, mm. um, and we dock at the lighthouse there, which is really beautiful. Oh. Um, and there are uh, actually lighthouse keepers that live there. It's an active. Well, it's not an active lighthouse, but it's. Um, but there are people that live there They're and kind there, of run yeah. it, which is very cool. Um, Watch the movie The Lighthouse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and then we stop, I mean, it depends. We've stopped in, uh, in Beacon now, um, in Long Dock Park. We stop in uh, Kingston at the Maritime Museum. Um, we stop in Newburgh. Ossining, okay. um, so you're sort of like kind of darting back and forth across the river till we get, um, we go to Marina One, which is over there in Dumbo, and then um, and then we come to Red Hook over here um, in the Erie Basin. Also over here in uh, Red yep. Hook. Yeah, exactly. So a little bit. Yeah, sure. And how is it coming down here into Red Hook? Yeah, I mean, for me, it, it's yeah. always like a homecoming. I always yeah. like it. Yeah, oh, nice. yeah, it feels like you're coming home. Um, it's nice to know that there's a shower on the other end of it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, oh, that's um, cool. You're, you're based in Brooklyn, but uh, you're always going up and down the Hudson. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, what else would you like to tell us about the Apollonia? Um, 
I always think about, uh, we have a crew member who is now out in California, Tanya. Yeah. Uh, but she always described the Apollonia as a floating environmental message, which I think is a really beautiful way to think about it, you know? Oh, cool, cool. Um, it's just an example of how to do things differently, you know, and I really appreciate that. Captain Sam always says, Uber has been a super highway forever moving things down to New York City and back. Um, and do you see other sailboats on the way? We do see some sailboats, mostly we see tugboats, tugboats okay. <laughs> powered by diesel. Right, right. Um, and so it's kind of a nice juxtaposition to that, to think about that there are other ways to do it. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then uh, DS asks, wait, you actually sleep on the boat overnight? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We live on the boat for for um, usually each run is about two weeks. Describe so, the sleeping quarters. Yeah. For us. How does it look like? Let me see um, my, uh, it's it's like you're camping on a boat. Like camping essentially. on a boat. Yeah. Okay. So we um, sleep in the wheelhouse. Uh, we roll our camping pads and sleeping bags out. Um, sometimes I like to sleep on deck just because it's okay. nice and pretty. Um, but yeah, just in a sleeping bag on a sleeping pad. Um, we have a little galley with a Coleman propane stove, and we actually eat pretty well. Um, uh, and yeah, there's no running water of any sort, so we have just like a composting toilet mm, as well. And how about holding goods? Uh, yeah. How does that work? Um, we were just talking uh, with Yolanda, who works for Cornell, who helped two summers ago we moved 10,000 pounds of oak logs mm. that were inoculated with shiitake mushrooms. Oh, wow. And actually, which was really amazing because we brought them down to the farm in Red Hook okay. to be a part of the CSA, which is also the CSA that I'm a part, I'm a member of, oh, nice, which nice. is really great. So I'm hoping this summer that we'll actually get some mushrooms from those logs that we brought down two years ago. Mm. Um, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's oh, kind of cool. cool. It's coming full circle. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Well, I know what's your favorite product aside from the shiitake mushrooms. Ooh, shiitake mushrooms. Um, I think Mika's cider okay. from Greenpoint Cidery is delicious. Um, yeah. Poor Devil hot sauce is excellent. We eat a lot of that on board. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, DSS, do you cook on board as well? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like I said, we have a little um, like propane Coleman stove that we cook on. Oh, cool. cool. Um, it's strapped down so it doesn't, you know, slide away. <laughs> and in your opinion, what's the most beautiful spot along the Hudson? Um, I really like, uh, it's called World's End, which is a little ominous, um, but it's just north of... Um, not a reference to the movie. No, not a okay. reference to the movie, of um, West Point. Okay. And it's, it, the, uh, the river gets really narrow there, and the, the landscape, the kind of uh, cliffs are really high, and so it's just kind of a dramatic um, part of the river. It's really beautiful, kind of windy. I like there, and there's an anchorage that we stay, that we dock at, um, just north of the GW Bridge, which is like always the last stop before we come into the city. And I like to sleep on deck that night. I usually I usually try to do that. You know, you wake up early in the morning and you can see the city and it looks really beautiful. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Alexis, thank yeah. you so yeah, much thank you. for chatting with us. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of uh, wind today. Let me know if you still hear me clearly. Uh, and uh, luckily Sarah behind us is fixing the, the huge uh, flag <laughs> that was clanking. Um, so let us know if you hear us clearly, otherwise we will go inside. Somebody has to speak up. And, oh my right. god, so cool. We've got a huge group. How's it going guys? Nice to meet you. How are you? Kenny, do you want to be next to the I want to coil this line over Okay, okay perfect, go for it. So we got to take like, like a two minute So sure. Brad, where, where are we right now? Glorious polluted body of water, but they may not have gotten to the end of the Gowanus Canal, which actually does flow into New York Harbor. So we're going into Gowanus Bay, which is sort of the mouth of the Gowanus Canal. Oh, interesting. So, you know, and, and, and if we're talking about the mouth of the Gowanus Canal, you, you probably want to have a little bit of like mouthwash. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's yes. right. Hopefully there's not mo uh, more water. Uh, Absolutely. Right, right, right. We got, a, we got a little bit of chop here, but that's a great thing. So I'm really excited because our next, uh, when Schooner Apollonia brings cargo to New York City and to a lot of its ports of call, we really hope that people can come down and pick up their goods at the dock. That's mm -hmm. ideal. They get to see the ship, they get to talk to the crew, but that doesn't work for everyone's schedule. So we have depots. So if you can't pick it up at the dock, the cargo gets brought to a depot, usually by cargo bike to keep it sustainable. And that brings us to our next set of guests here. We have a bunch of folks who are my friends from Principal's GI Coffee House oh, oh, in Gowanus, Brooklyn. Oh, very cool. And it's, it's an incredible place. And Nikolai is going to tell a little bit about Principal's. Oh, nice. 
repeat the name of the coffee house one more time? It's a Principles GI Coffee House. Okay, cool. Can't wait to try it. Do you guys also have a shop where people can sip on coffee? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Cool. It's, a, it's a whole cafe. It's okay. a huge space. Just making um, sure it wasn't just a roaster. Oh, yeah. yeah no, okay. there's a roaster next door. Okay. Um, but we, uh, we're we not affiliated with them. We serve uh, a bunch of different coffee from, from all over the world. Perfect. <laughs> so let us know a little bit how you work with the Apollonia. Yeah, so I mean, you know, Brad's in almost every day. It's kind of it's kind of his office. Yeah. <laughs> He's always in there working, you know, so on the, talking on coffee. the phone, you know, pacing out in, in front. You know, <laughs> eventually there's going to be a, a a trench out in front from uh, <laughs> from, where he, from where he paces when he's on the phone. Oh, nice, nice. Um, but yeah, yeah, Brad's in there all the time when. Uh, you know, we also, you know, we, so we hold on to goods for, for folks, like he said, you know, we're at Depot, so I think last time we got some uh, some of the rye um, from Apollonia that a few people were coming in to pick up. Um, too much of a hassle to have a few a few crates of, uh, of rye and other, other sale goods. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a one-year birthday? Yeah, 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 this weekend we're going to be celebrating the shop's uh, first birthday. Oh, um, happy birthday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so we'll be open uh, from 8 a.m. on Friday to 8 p.m. on Sunday. So. Oh, cool. Oh, that's awesome. What are you guys doing to celebrate? <laughs> so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've got... Um, We've got two bike races because yeah. uh, you know the owner's a big cyclist. It's a big like cyclist uh, space. So we've got an, a midnight race and a noon race. Mm. Oh wow! Um, I think there, there's like a, a two a.m. drag show. There's <laughs> oh very cool. Yeah, we got a, a few coffee tastings, a couple tea tastings. Yeah, it's gonna be yeah slumber party. Yeah, it's gonna be a open mic. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be tons of stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, very exciting. You have a coffee tasting. Yeah, yeah, I'm do yeah, I'm, I'm hosting two uh, two coffee tastings. Um, oh, nice! So yeah. it's a big space too. Yeah, yeah, it's massive. It oh, used to be. To it used to be um, where Brooklyn Solar manufactured solar panels. Oh, they outgrew the space and moved to a different space. Um, but we still have some of their solar panels on the roof, which is nice. You know, helps keep the uh, electricity bills a little lower. <laughs> oh, cool! So the um, guy, the coffee you're providing is. The one that's shipped on the Apollonia as well, or no? Uh, no, no. Okay, we okay. uh, we kind of just get coffee from from all over the place. A lot right. of like local New York roasters, roasters in the U.S., and a bunch of uh, international roasters as well. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, like a very very diverse lineup of, of coffee origins and right. coffee, uh, you know, roasters. Yeah. Oh, very cool. And what's your favorite part of being in Brooklyn? I mean, it's just a, it's a great city you know yeah yeah, yeah. The you know, community is awesome. yeah, yeah yeah great community oh, that's nice. you know great like culture anything like any kind of food you want you can find it in brooklyn right. cheaper than you can find it in manhattan and probably <laughs> better too <laughs> exactly exactly that's and right. if you know for any reason i want to go to to manhattan there's like a million trains that take me there so have you been on the Apollonia? Any, uh, any Not places? yet. Yeah. I would love to, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice, nice. That's awesome. That's exciting. Yeah. Uh, and have you been out on the Hudson in general? I have. Okay. Yeah, I have. And how has that experience been? I mean... If you can pass the bike. Yeah. It's just... It's an amazing uh, opportunity to... If you're on a tour, to hear about, you know, the history. But also, just you can be close to places that you see every day and you're that much closer like you feel like you can touch the statue of liberty like when el oh, when yeah. else can you do that not not there but you know you, like, oh, it's close you're surrounded yeah. by this water and you're surrounded by these huge buildings and when you're on a boat you can get so much closer and right. it's like i don't know it's it makes you feel more connected wonderful thank you so where can people find again uh, your depot and uh, coffee it's a Principal's GI Coffee House at a 139 9th Street down in Gowanus. Nice. Thank you so much yeah, for joining you. us. Appreciate thank that. You. Thank you. <laughs> have, a, have a happy birthday as well. Can't yeah. wait to see you at Principal's. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. Yeah. Thank you, Brad. Woohoo. Okay, well. Join in the pacing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, you bet. This okay. Is really cool. So, so let us know what we're Yeah, at. we are in one of my favorite parts of the New York City water. We are actually going right up into the Gowanus Canal. And, uh, Roy Raj is saying, oh, I've heard about the Black Manning. Yes, yeah, so right now yeah. there is a super fun cleanup going on on the upper part of the Gowanus Canal where they are scooping out all of that black mayonnaise. And they're working their way. No, it's not edible. 
Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> but it's funny, even the EPA uses the term black mayonnaise because this stuff is so bad yeah. that, like, they don't quite have a full technical term for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also, it's, uh, it's a, just a blob of... Uh, Many Abs- components of many right, right. Substances. Right, because the Guanas Canal suffers from pollution in two major ways. One is these like legacy industrial pollutants that go down into the muck and they stay there and then they have to get dredged up. But then there's also um, a whole bunch of combined sewer overflows, so CSOs that we know all too well in Guanas, um, where every time it rains, basically, your toilet, your sink, and your shower, everything you're flushing just goes straight into the waterway so the guanas canal gets over 360 million gallons of this cso all over the city because we have these ancient combined sewers and it would so right now one so thing they're doing New Yorkers, <laughs> this is we're up. yes we smell your business right, right. and if you look off over yeah. to your right you'll see that little green cupola there's like a little okay. um float dock there yeah that is actually the dock at the bunker launch site for the Gowanus Dredgers Canoe Club. Oh, I heard. Which, I yeah, heard. yeah, they actually get people out on the water for free. Um, so check out their calendar as well because they do all kinds of programming with music on the water, poetry on the water, science on the water, you name it. Um, it's a really good place to get in- engaged with the water right. in a real way. Mm-hmm. And be sure to warn us if you uh, do the horn. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and, and what, how far inland does uh, the Gowanus extend? It goes about 1.8 miles up, and like what we're seeing right now yeah. is this big bridge here, the Gowanus Expressway, it's part of the BQE. Right, one of um, the tallest in the world. Right. Along with the tallest train station. Too, That's right, right. yes, right behind it, you're and so right. do you sail into it? We, this is about as far as the Apollonia goes. Okay. The super, when the Superfund cleanup is uh, completed, we will definitely want to be sailing all the way up there. Um, but you know what these big green barges are over here? No, 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 where are they? Those are full of New York City's trash. They are that is garbage. So that big set of blue cranes, yeah. it's actually in, in the gray building behind it, garbage trucks roll up ramps into that building offload their garbage and then the garbage gets put in the compacted put in the green boxes and then it gets shipped out by barge across the harbor and everyone uh, round of hearts to our captain who is getting us out of the guanas canal (laughs) (laughs) because it is tricky territory yes um what what do you think people should know if they want to go into safe and going to uh waterways like these yeah there's a whole there's there's a whole host of different groups around the city yeah. who will try to get you on the water. Um, I would check with the Waterfront Alliance. That's mm. a good place to start. Um, but there's groups here in Gowanus, like the Gowanus Dredgers Canoe Club. There's the North Brooklyn Community Boathouse. There's Kayak Staten Island. There's the Red Hook Boaters. Okay. Um, there's the Long Island City Community Boathouse. And there's a whole bunch of different boathouses on the west side of Manhattan as well, mostly for kayaking. But those are a good sort of first step to get yourself engaged with the water, get to know a waterway. Yeah. Um, and that's what the dredgers do, is we try to get people out on the water and have fun on the water and build a relationship with a waterway. Because once you do, then you actually care enough to want to get it cleaned up. And you're going to keep helping okay. apply that like political pressure to make sure the cleanup doesn't stall out. Because it could definitely become a very beautiful area Absolutely. to visit and to hang out or for industry if ever comes Totally, back. totally. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. And then can people actually visit the schooner Apollonia too? Yeah. yeah. When, when Apollonia gets to the city next week, uh, there will be a series of events uh, on Wednesday evening on the solstice. June 21st. Oh, very cool. Uh, Apollonia will be at 115 Marina, an estuary restaurant in Brooklyn Bridge Park for green drinks. Mm. That's Wednesday night at 6 p.m. So stop on down. You can meet the crew. You can buy some sale freight goods. Um, and then the next night will actually be here in Gowanus Bay, just past this giant ship, the Lujane, uh-huh. on the other at Gowanus Bay Terminal, uh, we are very lucky to have a spot to dock at the Ready Center, which is a barge that we'll see as we keep going here. But that is a place, uh, again, through the courtesy of the Gowanus Bay Terminals, GBX, we have an event there that's going to be called Sail Freight Thursday. Uh, Next Thursday, 
the 22nd and people can come down basically from about 6 to 8 p.m. We have the Barge Rat Band which is provided by Shipwrecked, the local mini golf place. Oh, cool. um, <laughs> and people can swing down here to the band, they can pick up sail freight um, and just be out on the water at sunset which is just such a magnificent thing to be and do. That sounds amazing. Yeah. I'm glad you guys are doing that too. Yeah. Uh, and more green drinks. Green drinks is basically a chance for people who are who care about the environment and about sustainability to come together and talk about what's going on. And so obviously Apple being all about sustainable shipping, it's a great thing to talk about. And we love how these events always bring people together. And it's actually kind of what's been happening on the boat here today. Um, and yeah, you can see the Lujane and the old grain terminal. So a lot of why... Very beautiful. I never... Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen this before. That's amazing. Yeah, it's wonderful to get out on the water because you really do see the city anew. Yeah. And then, um... First, Susie says that what's underneath the Guanas Canal sounds like Cloverfield. <laughs> and then uh, a a DS has a very uh, relevant question to that. Is what animals have you seen? On ooh, the ooh, okay. Well, yeah. see, that's the interesting thing is despite all pollution, there are all kinds of animals living in the Gowanus Canal. I know it sounds crazy, but I've been out there canoeing enough to see them. Okay. There are blue crabs, there are herons, egrets, night herons, tons of little mud snails, like sometimes you'll see thousands of them. Oh, there are mussels too, Atlantic rib mussels. Everyone likes to talk about oysters in New York Harbor, but the oysters can't handle the pollution. So what lives in the Gowanus Canal and does the filtering where the oysters don't dare to tread? Mussels. So give them a lot of credit. They're doing good work in there. Oh, that's great, but they're not edible. You don't want to eat Atlantic <laughs> rib mussels. They're technically edible, but like no one wants to eat them. And yeah. then uh, how about further up the Hudson? So up the Hudson, oh man, there is like just a wealth of animals up there. Uh, and what would be the yeah. bigger ones? On the big bigger ones, I mean, you can sometimes even see deer swimming across the river. Oh, really? Yeah, that's yeah. It's they really swim. fascinating uh, to see, because there's some like really wild stretches of the land along the Hudson, places like Iona Island. Um, I always like to say Iona Island and so do you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is this is probably the time I'm supposed to get off camera after a remark like that. As Susie says, also cockles, <laughs> like uh, the famous song Cockles and Mussels. Cockles and Mussels, there are barnacles, definitely. Barnacles, okay, right. You know, one thing that you see up in the Hudson too is, it's unfortunate, is uh, the water chestnut, which is heavily invasive, and they leave these little grotesque looking shells um, that almost look like they're sort of an alien seed pod. Um, oh, wow. But, That's fascinating. Yeah, they, and they float, and sometimes they just like coagulate on the shore. But those are something you really don't want to be seeing because they're sort of suffocating out a lot of the native aquatic life along the water's edge. So oh, I'm, I'm going to see if I can get someone yeah, who's uh, Rob Buchanan, who actually does a lot of work on the waterfront down in this area as we head back out of Gowanus okay, Bay. Cool. Perfect. So I'll go grab Rob. Yeah, go for it. All right, this is gorgeous views, actually. I really love it. So right now we are bordering on Gowanus Red Hook, and then we see the views of both downtown Brooklyn with uh, Sauron right there in the distance. I mean the Brooklyn Tower. That's the name. <laughs> kind of looks like the Tower of Sauron from Lord of the Rings. And then uh, we have downtown right down there. And also we see the views of Jersey City. Wow, this is impressive. We can see three skylines. And then the Statue of Liberty right down there. Um, DS has a question for me before we go to our next guest is, uh, what have you learned from doing these lives that's fascinating you the most? Right now that, that um, strange uh, call, uh, barnacle that, that Brad just mentioned, I'm very fascinated about that. I want to learn more about that. That's fascinating. But well, many other things. Um, so also how um, shipping has been so important to New York City's history. Okay. Tell me. Ariel. Ariel, okay, I'm Rob. <laughs> Rob, nice to meet you. So uh, let me know a little bit about you, Rob. And, uh, I'm, and your involvement with uh, Apollonia. Okay. Well, um, my involvement is, is mainly through uh, Brad and Pat. I'm part of the human powered boating community and um, a boat builder. I built a lot of boats with kids in the harbor. Okay. And it's, with Pat, I built a couple. And it's. Um, you know, there's a connection between human power boating and wind power boating. It's just a kind of a logical, low-tech, like back to basics connection that, and, and so I think most of us in both sort of 
Well, it's, we're building wooden boats, uh, some plywood, some traditional, but yeah, they're wooden boats. Oh, wonderful. Because part of the deal is to, to get young people to enjoy using tools and making things, and, and wood is just such a great medium to work in, and it's forgiving and beautiful and fun. How long does that process take to build a wooden boat? I mean, it, it depends, but typically, yeah. ideally, you start in the fall. Okay work all winter because you don't want to be on the water in the winter and then you launch the boat in the spring that's the that's the goal it doesn't always happen that way right, of course <laughs> uh, and let me know a little bit more about the process of working with Brad in terms of building these boats well I you know the, the with Pat is the, the Pat, mostly. Okay. Um, we did a couple so, projects at, um, yeah we haven't met Pat yet Pat ah. Mason who works with classic harbor line as a captain as well and is associated with the schooner Apollonia so yeah, we we did um, down in Sunset Park, which is right over there. We built okay. a couple of dories, um, which are traditional work boats in Industry City, and then we launched them in the park down there, Bush Terminal Park. And you know, there's a lot of different agendas, but one of them was opening public access in Sunset Park, getting the community to have access to to the water, and and that's really something I worked on with Brad a lot is the the challenge of public access in all of these different neighborhoods and you know access means different things to different people too traditionally to city planners it just meant oh yeah there's a place where you could go down and look at the water right and I think that you know the next step is to go down and actually touch the water and get on the water and use the water mm -hmm. and and that's that's what you know and Brad is and the Gowanus dredgers when he worked with the dredger was the captain of the dredgers that's just a ongoing challenge that is it's a generational challenge because a lot of people who are in power now aren't comfortable with the water don't know about it are afraid of it yeah. and want to say no and they're you know that's the default response is no you can't do that but the city dwellers were disconnected from for so long and and water the water's poisonous and oh my god you went swimming in the harbor you're going to grow a third arm and you know <laughs> you know it's just not like that and i think working with young people is a way of getting the next generation sort of attuned to the fact that the harbor is first of all it's public space it belongs to everybody and also that it you know in most days in most places it's swimmable and with proper training you can use the water uh, recreationally and and in with your community in boats and uh, and I think it totally does connect to sail freight and Apollonia and the idea of like bringing the, the waterfront back to sustainability but also to a human scale that everybody can understand and, and be a part of without having to take all these dramatic steps and well, part of sustainability is also the ability to learn how to build yourself to make things to yeah. make things yourself and to not and not the order them yeah. by clicking on some website and having right. it shipped from the other side of the world a lot of this stuff we can make and we and should it make for greater innovation too because yeah. once you see the actual building process you learn how to innovate it and to yeah. better it. Yeah. And then um, yesterday I saw uh, Brooklyn Boatworks, the kids there, and they, their faces lit up <laughs> when they saw, when I saw them going on the boats and that those boats going on the water, which is yeah. very fascinating to see the impact it has on people emotionally when they build these boats. Oh yeah, so, no, absolutely. That's where Pat is working now. He's the, the new, I think he's the lead instructor there. Right. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. You. You're, um, one other yeah. thing that you should be aware of, I okay. think we're going to go on the other side of Governor's Island, but there's a, Governor's Island and public access is an amazing story that's not over yet. Ooh, tell us. But there's a, there's a really nice beach on yeah. the Buttermilk Channel on the Governor's Island side. Okay. And it's just been a multi-year battle to try and get them to say, yes, this can be an access point for human-powered boats. And it hasn't happened yet. There is a, a little dock that you can land on on weekends further up, but there needs to be, it's a park. There needs to be more of a kind of a 24 seven access for small boats. And it's, uh, it's been a really interesting campaign. It's kind of reminiscent of you guys trying to find places for Apollonia to tie up and really, you know, it's just. Cause this just, is notoriously uh, shallow channel? This it's no no the channel's not shallow and, okay. and and it doesn't matter in a kayak it's fine the beach is what you want really okay. but okay. but um but yeah you know there's all these piers here that that could be access points for Apollonia someday and and 
you know, I hope they are. And Jonathan is asking uh, how deep are the waters right by that beach landing? Well, as you get inside the buoy, they get pretty shallow, you know, and, and, and so you can't bring a big boat in there. But but for small boats, you can. And okay. so I, I just think that the access discussion about Governor's Island is ongoing and that, that someday we can have a lot more access there. Exactly. So. That's right. Thank you so much. I All appreciate right. it. Thank you. Have a good day. Next, All right. Okay, off in our background is the state of New Jersey. And so we have someone here who has actually come all the way from New Jersey, Ed, who is from the Carteret Municipal Marina, um, which is a place that we dock. And I'll let him tell you a little bit more about that. Ed, here you go. And what's your name? My name is Ed, Ed Hayden. Ed, oh, um, Ed okay, cool. So yeah, Brad and his crew came in last year. <laughs> For the, for the first time. <laughs> yeah. So it was great having them come in. It's a, a fantastic boat. Uh, nice to greet the crew. So they came in just for an overnight. They picked up a load of coffee. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I should digress into a story, but while they were there don't overnight, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, about 100 yards from them, another boat caught fire. Oh, no. Okay. So they had a quiet night and an eventful morning. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, unfortunately, there was a little damage there, but they were safe. And, oh, good. But it made it for a memorable trip, and I got to spend a lot of time with them just talking to them during that time period. So when Brad called back this year, it was really nice to hear that they were coming back. And he says that they're going to, when they came through once again for coffee, my relationship with them was purely to make sure they got in there and had a place to do their business. So we're very close to the warehouse okay. where they were getting the coffee. Um, they use their bicycle with the trailer to get on and off the marina mm. to bring the stuff back. So it's a very convenient location for them. And we're glad that we could help them out. And how is it working in the marina nowadays? Oh, I love the marina. Um, yeah. I actually... And the person who was running the marina had to leave due to medical issues. Ed, you need to run the marina. <laughs> so I ended up running a marina. And it's on the New Jersey side. It's now. on the New Jersey side, okay. yes. Oh, cool. So uh, from underwater, you're probably talking about 40 minutes with a motor, yeah. a little bit longer with a sail, but it's a nice location. It, you got a decent run right up into the city. And then we go down, if you go down south from us, you go into the Raritan Bay. There's a lot of good fishing. In so actually, there. what I'm very curious about is um, your sa uh, the the sail the sailboat is bringing the goods to the yeah. marina. Uh, how does the what does the marina provide those goods? How does it? Well, we're, again, spread we're we're, uh, we're just a docking station for them. Okay. So we're not a, we're not selling their goods. So who comes in uh, to the marina? Yeah, in general, for us, it's yeah. mostly pleasure boats, okay. uh, fishing. Uh, some people that are here just to go out for the sales, uh, pri but again, primarily it's people who want to go out and have a good time. Oh, uh, I see. We don't have a lot of commercial. We have some commercial fishermen. Yeah. <laughs> but um, beyond that, uh, Brad's boat is the biggest one that's been in for us. Oh, so uh, it's a beautiful boat too. So, but again, we're here to give them a good place to to dock to dock and get their stuff back and so forth. there's no transfer of goods on the dock on not the to us okay okay so the warehouse is in Carteret that supplies the ah, coffee I see so they come and it's a rather quick trip for them even on the yeah. bike it's like a five minute round trip so it makes it really easy for them to get the stuff oh fascinating back and forth. oh yeah oh, so I again see. they're being green there's no they're not yeah. putting it in a truck or anything it's just all pedal power. That's why I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. All, all pedal power. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. So. That's that's actually really uh, yeah. awesome that, that everything's so close too. Exactly. Yeah. So, and we're looking forward to having them back later on this season. Oh, cool. So. Awesome. Ed, I appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you so well, thank much you. For, for chatting with us for a little while. And Take keep care. up with the great work with the marina. Thank you yeah. very much. Take care. <laughs> All right, everyone, I think we have a few more speakers. Uh, this is awesome. Feel free to ask any questions. Um, 
And uh, knows Brad knows plenty of the Hudson and shipping, so feel free to ask any questions. I'll stop them as well. And I think we need to meet Pat too, because a few people reference Pat. Yeah. Is it time to wrap up? Uh, yes. Let's meet Pat, and then uh, okay, and then wrap up uh, shortly after. Pat, clean my come on out. So Pat has been an awesome part of the Schooner Apollonia team as our climate strategist, and he also has a history working with Classic Harbor Line. So I'll let you tell your story. Here you go. Yeah, yeah, great yeah, to see you. Well, and, over, uh, yeah. yeah, so I'm a captain here with Classic Harbor Line and uh, work on the harbor for, I've uh, been here about five years now, mm. and I work with some other boats as well. And uh, yeah, I got to know Brad and Sam and the, the uh, crew of uh, Apollonia there in the last couple of years. And, uh, I also have another part of my life, which is... Uh, Let me have you over here. Yeah. You're backlit by the sun, so it's <laughs> sure, a nice silhouette. Sure. <laughs> yeah, so another uh, another part of my life is uh, teaching. So I teach uh, uh, climate change related classes uh, at, at Columbia University. Oh, well, that's amazing. And then yeah. uh, Nancy's asking, how is this boat powered since you work with the uh, Classic Harbor Line? Yeah, yeah. You probably have some experience with the Kingston. Yeah, totally. So I, I drive this one too um, as part of the fleet. Uh, this boat's a single engine boat. Okay. Uh, so in terms of other vessels on the harbor, this one's pretty efficient. And it's right underneath us at the moment? Yeah, okay. yeah. It's, uh, it's under, underneath us. It's really a cool setup. There's the engine and there's also a big stabilizer under that box you're looking at there. Oh, a gyroscope. It's a gyroscope, yeah. Oh, so it keeps it a uh, smooth ride. Oh, very cool. And yeah. then um, why work with the Apollonia as well? Yeah, so my, uh, my climate teaching uh, led me to try to combine both the worlds, so the boating and the, uh, the academics and the sustainability. Um, so when I heard about Apollonia first, I, I found it so exciting and I thought, you know, somehow I got to be a part of this and connected with Sam and Brad um, and realized that a lot of people are interested in Apollonia, but they have a lot of questions about what it means to be sustainable, what Apollonia does to make a difference. Um, and as the Apollonia project evolves, we're continually shaping that story. Uh, oh, so part of, part of my work is to um, communicate that message to the public about how we are sustainable, yeah. uh, the broader meaning of sustainability, mm -hmm. and, and what we're doing to change people's minds and to get the message out about climate change. That's amazing. And then um, people are saying that being on the boat really brings people together. Yeah. It does, it does. Uh, any boat, really, for, for that matter. This one in particular, the layout is perfect for that, and Apollonia the same. Um, when people come down to see Apollonia on the dock, it's just so interesting because it's not a really fancy yacht, uh, right. but it is a schooner, so it's got the sails. They get close and they realize it's a working vessel. Um, and then the questions start flooding in about what we're doing and why we choose to not use the engine on that boat, why we only right. wait on the wind. Um, oh, and then the questions are become even more how we actually make the trips work up and down the river without using a diesel engine. So business-wise, it is viable. It is it is feasible. Yeah, yeah, out. yeah. So uh, okay. Apollonia is a for-profit business, mm -hmm. and uh, that's something we're committed to to show that you know business can be done differently. Okay. Uh, it doesn't have to be you know the same thing over and over again that follows the same model. Is there a way that you guys educate other potential? sailors out there that would want to do the same thing in terms of shipping business? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we start with younger sailors, um, you know, even in high school and, and, you know, slightly older than that, getting them trained to learn how to be on a boat and operate a boat safely, operate a schooner, which is a whole nother ball game. Right. right. Um, Apollonia has got a really big element that's uh, to it that's educational. So it's right. training. And then through being on the boat and through the sail training, we start talking about the environmentalism and why we do things like not run the engine. Um, and you see people's minds changing with that, right? And yeah. then they go out and they become our ambassadors and they, they spread the word around. That's very cool. Pat, thank you so much for chatting with us. I appreciate it. Great, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And then let me uh, go back to Brad. Great. Whoa. <laughs> Shaky seas. So let's say goodbye to Brad. And then I'm going to show you a little bit more of the beautiful skyline. Brad, if you can sit right next to me. Okay. Uh, where can people find more about the Schooner Apollonia? All right. Well, you can head to Instagram, which is www.schoonerapollonia.com. Um, and also, you know, I know some people have mentioned it too, but uh, I'm really lucky this year to be a fellow with the uh, Center for Post-Carbon Logistics. Oh, cool. 
Okay. Now that is an entity that is all about this task that you know includes Apollonia and cargo bikes and electric vehicles. But how can we move goods with as little carbon as possible from point A to point B? And let's think of creative ways to do that. Let's shift goods that are already, say, moving down the Hudson from the Hudson Valley to New York City. How can we shunt more of them into sustainable means of transportation so that we're doing something about the climate change issue um, in a practical way? Yes. Please uh, expand our help. Our farmers markets to expand. <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> farmers markets, I mean, even if you think, of, one thing we've done is um, galas or a, a galas big event. Oh, cool, cool. So if oh, your organization or your business oh, is awesome. having a big event and yeah. you are, you, you, you know, you have beverages, you have food, you have giveaways, whatever, can you source those things regionally and can you get them transported in a more sustainable way? Because every little bit like that chips away at these emissions that are otherwise just like continuing to rise. So. Let's yeah. find let's find practical, positive, little ways to move the needle. Definitely. Thank you so much, Brad, for uh, chatting with us today. Absolutely. About Apollonia. I'm very excited to uh, share more about that event uh, potentially, and also one day maybe ride the Apollonia myself. That you would be as incredible. Well could ride the Apollonia yourself <laughs> one day. Yes. And uh, thank you so much for introducing us to all those speakers. Ariel, yeah. thank you so much. This has been fabulous and fascinating. Wonderful. Thank you. Take care. All right. And thanks, Classic Harbor Life. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right, everyone. So that is, that was Brad Vogel. Awesome guy. Wonderful to chat with him. Schooner Apollonia. Uh, I'm going to show you just a little bit more of the skyline because it's just so gorgeous. Just so everyone, we were chatting pretty intensely with a lot of the speakers, which was amazing. And now we need a breath to enjoy the gorgeous views before we go back ashore to Pier 62. Uh, Nancy says you need to do a live on the Apollonia. Oh, yes. I think that is quite needed. Uh, Ida says, good question, Ariel. This is what I wanted to hear uh, from the perspective of the youth uh, getting into sustainable sailing. I'm so happy. Uh, Freddie says, can we meet the captain? Yes. Here's Captain Timmy. Captain, how's it going? How's the waters today? Rocky, but we didn't do it. <laughs> it is, it is. I got a nice shower, which was very nice. Uh, I'm getting it too. <laughs> oh, I'm meeting in here as well. Yeah, yeah. Going right through this window. Oh, wow, that's amazing. How long have you been uh, captaining? I've been driving for four months. Four months, okay. But I've been on the water for six years. For six years? Oh, wow, plenty. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the, the relatively smooth ride despite the choppy waters. Appreciate it. All right, that was the captain, everyone. And you shared a great day on the boat, says Nancy. So stay tuned. We're doing live videos uh, tomorrow and Friday. We have two live videos set up. Uh, check out the times at Classic Harbor Line Instagram. Go to ClassicHarborLine.com to learn more about their tours. You can come on the Kingston itself, meet Captain Timmy, uh, Captain Shannon as well, as you saw in previous live videos. And there's many other wonderful captains, as we met, also Pat, um, on these journeys. There's jazz tours, there are tours about the architectural history of New York City. Uh, there's uh, ones that involve food and whining and dining. Uh, so there's many, many other tours out there. And one more time, ooh, the views. Ten Yards, Midtown, and Nancy says you showed a great day at the boat. Oh, my pleasure. I want to meet Marianne Gillian. <laughs> David, are you making a reference to Gill uh, uh, a show? Let me know. And then Mater says, definitely worth a like. Yes, if you enjoyed this live video, slam that like button right now so people can enjoy more of these boat trips around the harbor. I am working with Classic Harbor Line. If you want to see my own work, you can go to Urbanist Exploring Cities and also Urbanist Live. And on TikTok, I'm at Ariel Vieira. And you can see my live videos there and also my short videos there where I do Instagram Reels, TikToks, YouTube Shorts, and live videos all around the world, not just New York City. And I do show more waterways uh, in New York City, I'm showing other different vessels here, such as the USS Wasp, and I've gotten 
uh, over to many other parts of the world, London, Copenhagen, France, Italy, many other places. Right there is the Empire State Building. Uh, so he says, please do a three hour tour. And okay, you need to more watch more old TV, says uh, David, indeed. Wow. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Ariel. This is Classic Harborline. Watch my own show, Urbanist, Exploring Cities on YouTube, Urbanist Live on Instagram. And stay tuned for Classic Harborline live videos tomorrow and Friday. We have two live videos set around the afternoon, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And then later on, on June 24th, we're going live for what is called the Pride Sale. That's gonna be really fun. And then July 4th, we're gonna do an epic live showing you fireworks on Classic Harbor Line. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring and stay curious, my friend. Have a great day. Bye-bye.